defend yourself from a ferocious predator. Many animals have built-in defenses to protect them from their enemies. This frilled lizard is able to spread its collar to make itself look larger and more dangerous. And this porcupine can bristle its quills to scare an enemy away. Just a light touch of the needle-sharp quills will force any predator into a prickly predicament. Hi, I'm Jack Hanna. Join me on Zoo Life to learn more about the animals of the world. that help living beings to survive. We are guided by our senses, and as humans can only fathom these sensory elements through our human perspective. Animal senses span an enormous range. We may never be able to perceive the world from an animal's point of view, but we can try and decipher why it is that some animal senses are sharper than others and many maintain senses that are keener than our own. At the Toledo Zoo in Toledo, Ohio, an innovative exhibit was created to explain animal senses and adaptations for the worlds in which animals live. Norma Lewis, the museum curator, elaborates on this idea. There's no one correct adaptation for a particular environment. Adaptations are what help you survive in a particular habitat. If you were going to live in the ocean, you would need to be able to survive in an environment that's very salty. Of course, it's also wet, and if you live in the water, you have to be able to take oxygen out of the water instead of out of the air. You need to be able to move in a different way. That's why animals that live in the water have a fairly similar shape. If you're going to live in the desert, you have to be able to survive in an area that's very hot and very dry, but yet very cold at night. And plants and animals that live there have to have very special adaptations so that they don't die of thirst. Living in herds is an adaptation to living out on a grassland because in a grassland you're very exposed to any predators that might be around. And if you live in a herd, you have a lot of animals around you so that a predator might eat one of those other animals instead of you. Then we have other kinds of adaptations that don't really matter what kind of an environment you live in. For example, flight. No matter which habitat you live in, you might be able to fly. Okay, penguins sort of fly underwater. You fly if you, if you live in a grassland or you can fly if you live in a forest or in a desert, it doesn't matter. We call those universal adaptations. They're adaptations that aren't specific to a particular habitat. This exhibit helps kids understand the relationship between plants and animals and the environment they live in, and that if we lose one, we're likely to lose the other one as well. to obtain a bird's eye view of the way in which birds and their feathers are put together with the help of Marine World Africa's USA's senior bird trainer, Don Fitzgerald. Do you think owls are that intelligent? Well, not very intelligent, oh. actually. They have really large eyes to have that so they have better vision. But actually, those large eyes take up so much room in their head, didn't leave much room for a brain. 
So Hemingway's good at what he does, which is capture prey and survive out, out in the wild. Yes, he keeps turning his head. Why do you just turn his eyes? Well, he can't move his eyes in their sockets like we do. He has to turn his whole head. That's why they can turn their head 270 degrees. He's got big ears. Well, those aren't his ears. Those are just little tufts of feathers. Actually, the ears are just holes in the sides of their head. And one's higher than the other one to help them locate sound better. What's better, the eyesight or the hearing? And they have keen eyesight, and they also have excellent hearing. I think they use their hearing a little bit more for hunting than their eyesight. Why do they refer to the owl as a bird of silent flight? Well, because they have soft, flexible feathers that allows them to swoop down silently on their prey, whereas a hawk or a falcon would make a noise, but an owl will not make any noise. <laughs> That's right. He's a new world vulture. His name's Latrak. Boy, hey. something else. Do they like soar or fly real fast? They do a lot of gliding and soaring, circling over meals. They have a well-developed sense of smell, which isn't usual for a bird. And that is so that they can find their meal. It helps to find their meal. They also have excellent eyesight. I notice he's got a hole in his nose. Yeah, that's right, because they're known to eat dead, rotting carcasses, stick their head right in there. And that way, if they get any food cut, caught in there, it'll fall right through the nostril and it won't block their nasal passages. They have the bald head to, in order to keep it clean, right? That's right. They're messy eaters. They'll stick their head right in that carcass, and that way the sun can bake off any food particles that were left over from the meal. Well, thanks a lot, Latrex. Hope you'll see me on the road someday, buddy. <laughs> wow. I was using all my resources and my good sense in my efforts to find Mark Jardarian, manager of Marine World's Wildlife Theater. I followed the scent of his trail like a bloodhound with his nose to the ground. And like a cat on the prowl, I listened acutely for any revealing sounds he made. And I always kept a close lookout with my eagle eyes for any signs that I was getting close. Tent. Well, Mark's supposed to be right here somewhere. <laughs> man, what? Oh, man. Hope he shows up. Get your tongue back in there. Get your tongue back in there. Hey, hey, Mark. Hey, Mark. I say he's got his tongue out. Hey, don't worry about it. She's not going to bite you if that's what you're worried about. Um, she's just tasting her environment. Here, let me take her from you. Tasting her environment? Yeah, she'll pick up odor molecules on her tongue. She'll bring them inside her mouth, touch the Jacobson's organ that's in her mouth, and then she knows what's happening in her environment. Also, they stay hot by heat? Right, they, they detect heat, and they can also taste their environment is exactly what they're doing. Beautiful. What is it? She's pretty, it's a boa constrictor. This is Fluffy. Fluffy? Yeah. Nice name. Okay, Fluffy, I'll let you go over okay. there. She's a pretty slow animal. I'm going to let her go. There you go. This animal's fast. This is the, you're saying the world's fastest representative of the world's fastest land animal. Wow. This is the African cheetah. This is Arthur. Put your hand right under his chin there. What do you feel? It's like a little motorboat. He's, he's purring. These are the, one of the largest wild cats that can purr. Well, listen to that. Listen. Hear that. And his eyes are real big. He's the only cat that does all this hunting during the day. He's a diurnal animal. Now, just how fast can a cheetah go? 70 miles an hour, top 70? speeds. His speed is probably one of his most important features because that's how he catches his prey. In oh, fact, I see. If you see pictures of cheetahs running in slow motion, um, the head is forward, straight forward, and the ears go straight back. He's really aerodynamically designed. What a real treat to be able to touch the fastest animal on Earth. It is. Problems? Yeah. What's the matter? I thought they go throw his quills, be careful. Porcupines don't throw their quills. What? Porcupines won't throw their quills. You're safe. You don't need this. 
They totally did. No, it's an old wives' tale. Here, let me turn this guy around. This is Quilliam, my North American porcupine. Dolly, David, how come when they fluff up and you see them in the movies, the dogs have quills in them? That's because what he'll do to protect himself if an animal comes up from behind him, he'll whip his tail around and he'll actually slap you with it. And by the way, watch it because there's 30,000 quills right there. And you know what quills are? They're actually modified hair. That's just real how, thick hair. How come I couldn't pull that out? It just stuck in there. Almost. There's actually little microscopic barbs at the end there. So once you get stuck by one of these things, they stay in. It really does the trick. So that's his main means of defense, these quills? Right, that's what's going to protect him. In fact, top speed for a porcupine is a slow shuffle. So, so, so when you've got 30,000 quills like this, you really don't have to run away from anything. Now what about, has he got good hearing and good eyesight? He's got poor hearing, poor eyesight, oh. but excellent quills. Oh. <laughs> See you later. Get the sticks to somebody, will you? <laughs> something wow this is an indian fruit bat and also called flying fox wow, she's showing her her wings. wings yeah her nails are kind of in that shape of a hook and so right now you're acting as the branch in the tree she has an excellent sense of smell uh, what she would do is she'd fly many miles in search of real ripe juicy fruit and as she smells it she's got excellent vision too she'd swoop down land in the tree and start eating it. What about hearing? You got such big ears. Good sense of hearing. Her hear, her ears are always twitching back and forth, and she's listening to different noises. Here, go oh, ahead wow. and take this grape and hold it down here, and she'll eat it right out of your hand. She'll suck the juice out, and she'll spit out the seeds and the pulp, and that's what really helps reforest the rainforests around the world. They're a real important animal. <laughs> This business of the senses was all starting to make sense to me. Manager of Marine World's primate family, Liam Hussey, was able to make it even clearer as we touched the subject of senses and adaptations similar to our own. Their senses compared to ours are basically the same, except their hearing is a lot more sharp because in the wild, they live in very densely populated, densely overgrown areas. They can't see as much as they'd like, so they rely on their hearing for listening to other animals' vocalizations, listening for predators approaching. It's amazing, their, their hands, how much they are like ours. Yeah, it's incredible. Their hands and their feet have pretty much ended up almost the same. So they have a thumb on their foot. An opposable thumb on their foot and an opposable thumb on their hand. But the funny thing is, if you look up, look at the size of the foot, look at the size of the big toe, it's huge, and the size of their thumb, it's tiny. Huh. And they think the reason for this is they use their hands so much for swinging, they had a large thumb that would get in the way. Their feet are developed in such a way that they can hold a rope or a branch just almost as easily as they can with their hands. That's why they climb and move so fast in the trees. <laughs> I had the sense that Mark and I were hot on the trail of something big. I smelled it in the air. Hey, look what I see. Here comes Biff. Yeah. It's yeah. feeding him bananas, he won't bite. There you go. <laughs> yeah, what we get a bunch of bananas in. Actually, this is this is a South Southeast Asian Vinterong, and he's a member of the Mongoose family. Dang, His name is Biff. He and smells like popcorn. They do, they have scent glands and they smell like hot butter popcorn. This is the neatest creature. Wow, look at the teeth on that thing. You know, I think he smelled a banana. Yeah, hurry up. They've got a great sense of smell. And it uh, looks like you're out of banana. Yeah, no. So you better... Biff, yeah, you don't like ears, do you? <laughs> They're arboreal. They spend most of their time up in trees. He's wow. thinking of you as a tree right now. And the tail is like a fifth limb. Okay, in fact, so... they've got one of the longest prehensile tails of any mammal in the world. Boy, he is absolutely Isn't he great. Is he, is he, his paws real strong? Yeah, they're they're real strong. Um, I think he's going to see go and see Mark. But there he is. Hey, he's Biff. using the tail. No, on no, he's got to my neck. Are you okay? Oh yeah. Here, wait, I'll go over this way. Yeah, there we go. That's good. Great. All right. Good. Good. Look at this tail. Look at that thing. It's very strong tail. Very sharp claws. Look at that. See what? Look at his feet. See how he's balancing. Watch his toes there. Grasp the uh, the Jeez. wires. Okay. Here we go. Here's your favorite Biff cantaloupe. He can Ready? Jump? He'll jump. Watch. Biff. Biff. Jump. Right there. There it is. Isn't that neat? Wow. 
the, are these whiskers sensory or is the whiskers are very sensitive and what I was going to show you earlier is feel his hair. You remember how you said how bristly it is? Yeah. When the hair is that bristly, it serves like, it's almost like his body's completely covered with whiskers. It's very sensitive. So as he's climbing through the trees at night, he's not only feeling with his feet, but also with his hair and with oh. his whiskers. Look at these ears. Isn't that a trip? Looks like a wild hair. Dude. Yeah, it does. Looks like it, looks like, it looks like a, 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 a one of those penguins. Yeah, yeah. ears. That's right. <laughs> We've all heard stories how dolphins rescue people at sea or even help ships through rough oceans. With me is Jim Mullen, who's worked with these animals for over, what, 18 years? About 28 now. 28? <laughs> Are they really that smart? Well, yeah, they're equivalent to what I feel is an alien intelligence. You know, they're very intelligent animals as, as, a, as a social group and social order. What about as far as their, their eyesight and hearing? What, what are their senses as far as uh, how good are they? Okay, well, eyesight is pretty similar to ours underwater. If we were to open our eyes in the water, that's what they see kind of above the water. Uh, their best sense is hearing. They do have ears. They are located about two inches behind and about one inch below that near the eye. And they, all they are are little pinholes. They don't have any external collecting like we do to collect the sound because water can carry sound four times faster than a can of air. They have uh, this echolocation that enables them to find their way in murky waters. Their echolocation is pretty much ten times above our range of hearing. We seem to think that it's generated within the, within the, the head itself and it's uh, pulsed out through the melon or the very fatty tissue in the front of the part of the head that concentrates the beam of sound and there's different pulses that come out of them. But what it does is when it bounces off of any given object, it gives them the size, the shape, a density, gives them all that information within split seconds. What do all these sounds mean? Well, all different sounds mean different things in their social life. Uh, but when they do these little squeaks and whistles and pops, it's just a way of, uh, uh, of getting attention from us. When they're born, they have a signature whistle. The babies get a signature whistle that tells them the rest of their life who they are. Huh. And mom will always be able to tell them, so will the rest of the group. Their knowledge, their lore is all stored in each generation's brain. And how do they pass that on to, to their young ones? That's something that no one really knows. Do they need a storehouse of knowledge? Like we have libraries. I don't know. No one knows. Maybe all they need is enough knowledge to exist. 